This is Gary Galanti, and welcome to the screencast on Failure to Thrive. I have no relevant disclosures. In terms of the objectives of this presentation, while the term Failure to Thrive has its limitations, it is a very commonly used term in clinical practice. So we are going to go through some of the proposed definitions and their limitations, and hopefully convince you to better define poor growth when necessary using the term pediatric malnutrition. We're going to discuss the potential sequelae of failure to thrive in malnutrition and discuss the main mechanisms for malnutrition and organize these etiologies into a differential diagnosis that will hopefully inform your approach to the workup for a patient who is not growing appropriately. I want to begin by posing the question of what is the best description of this term failure to thrive? So pause your screencast if you'd like to think about this, but the best while obviously least specific definition would be the failure to meet expected standards of growth. The other three options listed can all be found among the various listed definitions of failure to thrive depending on what source you use and this variability in the definition is one of its biggest limitations as a descriptive term. So with that in mind let's try our best to explore the definitions of failure to thrive in its current use. So as alluded to the most commonly accepted definition of failure to thrive is the failure to meet expected standards of growth, and this is usually with respect to the child's weight for age. This definition, however, immediately leads to more questions in terms of what expectations or standards should be used, which we'll touch on in a moment. One limitation of this term is that it should be perceived as a sign of undernutrition, but as we will see that is not always the case. It is a sign and it is not necessarily indicative of disease, but can be a final common pathway of various different processes. So I'm going to bring in a case over the next few slides to help illustrate some of the points. So put yourself in a pediatric clinic and you're about to assess a 21 month old girl and the clerk hands you a growth chart with one data point. And the weight, as you can see here, is plotted less than the third percentile on the curve as per the CDC. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, does this little girl have failure to thrive? Well, Chart-based definitions of single data points are often used in the definition of failure to thrive, and these are going to be listed here. Low weight for age, particularly less than the third percentile, given that that is a commonly used percentile line on the CDC and other growth curves, this would be the most commonly used definition to remember. However, it is really challenging to interpret it in isolation, as you may imagine just from looking at this case, and the definition is rather arbitrary. Why do we use the third percentile line? Why do we use the fifth percentile line? Why are there different definitions? So other parameters are also considered, such as low length and height, which would otherwise be referred to as short stature. Um, however, when a patient's weight is compared to the height, either as a weight relative to length um, or as body mass index, these are very likely better measures of nutritional status as a single data point, so remember this for later. Some definitions of failure to thrive therefore use weight for height less than third percentile or BMI less than third percentile as diagnostic. So back to the case you're seeing, you should first note that the weight for age was a single point and so this patient could have failure to thrive and you probably would like some more information, both a current length measurement and prior growth measurements, but before we do you know that this is a CDC growth curve and ask yourself is there any significance to the type of curve used and the answer is yes because when you plot it on the WHO chart this girl is now clearly above the third percentile. So because many clinicians still use the CDC growth references in their interpretation of expected growth patterns it's important to highlight why the Canadian experts have favored the use of WHO growth standards between the ages of 0 and 5. These were derived from a large global sample of children of various different backgrounds and they were living in what were deemed to be favorable growth conditions and in optimal health and they were all exclusively or predominantly breastfed for a minimum of four months. Measurements were also taken more frequently and done prospectively. So for all of these reasons it's considered a more ideal representation of growth and these curves should be used. When you use the WHO growth curves, this population was generally leaner and taller, which means that more children are classified as stunted or short stature when they're replotted on the WHO curve, while less are classified as underweight when you um, replot them, 
And similarly, less will be considered to have failure to thrive when you use a weight less than the third percentile as your definition. And this was the case with our example. And another point to consider is that formula-fed infants tend to be lighter in the first three to four months of life relative to breastfed populations, and therefore are more likely to be considered failure to thrive on the WHO curve. However, formula-fed infants tend to become heavier after the first four to six months, so when assessing formula-fed infants on the WHO curve, it's just a reminder that this should be considered in order to avoid unnecessary investigations or counseling regarding increasing or limiting formula or food intake. So another big difference between WHO and CDC charts are what are considered to be the quote-unquote major percentile lines. Now in CDC, they are rather arbitrary percentile lines, for example, 3rd, 10th, 25th, and 50th percentile. Whereas the WHO uses statistics and a normal distribution to arrive at the percentile lines as roughly equivalent to the number of standard deviations from the mean or the Z scores as you can see here. And based on that, the WHO standards will define the terms as underweight, wasted, or stunted as Z scores less than negative two or more than two standard deviations below the mean, which would be considered statistically significant. Um, and so weight, underweight would be weight for age, wasted would be weight for length or BMI, and stunted would refer to the height or length for age. Now, interestingly, because the two standard deviations below the mean is more or less the third percentile, this does actually tend to align with the standard definition. So back to the case, replotted on the WHO curve, the weight now seems appropriate. But as you'd asked for, you now get additional measurements, and you see that her weight was greater than the 85th percentile at birth. So she has actually crossed downwards past two major percentile lines, and this is also commonly reported as failure to thrive, as you can see at the bottom there, um, a deceleration of weight gain leading to crossing down of two major percentile lines. So does this make you reconsider that she has failure to thrive? And the answer is maybe. So now we move on to failure to thrive definitions based on weight velocity using multiple data points. Experts will rightfully suggest that multiple or longitudinal growth measurements are preferable to one, and that remains true. However, simply using major percentile lines in the definition for failure to thrive while it's practically quick and easy to do in clinic, it does raise challenges. So one, as we just mentioned, different growth curves use different major percentile lines, as we've listed there. And actually, as a result of that, WHO Canadian Pediatric Endocrine Group curves have been created, which have similar standards as the WHO being referenced in the curve, but use the percentile lines to line up with the CDC, knowing that that is the most commonly used in practice. The other thing is that even using the traditional CDC major percentile lines, we find that moving up or down is actually not uncommon, particularly in the first two years of life. In one study, 39% of healthy children crossed two major percentile lines up or down in weight for age in the first six months, and 6 to 15% from 6 to 24 months. This is particularly so if your weight was greater than the 75th percentile at birth, as was with our case, where almost 60% crossed down more than two major percentile lines within the first two years. So it's better to look at weight gain velocity relative to expectations, and as shown in the table here are references for weight gain for females and males based on age. And you can do this by searching in your browser WHO weight velocity, and it's the first link you'll see. But the key take home here is that weight gain that slows can signal insufficient nutrition, uh, even before you will see drops in the Z-score percentiles. So it's probably better to look at it like this, although it may not be the most practically easy thing to do in clinic. And so what are the other markers of nutritional status in pediatrics other than weight for age that can possibly be preferable? Well, head circumference and particularly le length or height can be affected in chronic malnutrition. And the latter actually factors into the newest definitions of malnutrition, which we'll get to in a moment. Weight for length and body mass index do have their limitations, but they are considered both to be preferable to a weight for age as a measurement. There are also skin fold thickness measurements that can be done, but this requires expertise and training. However, a mid-upper arm circumference is an easy and reliable nutritional measurement that can be done in any office with simply a measuring tape, and it is a measure of both muscle and subcutaneous fat in the upper arm. So the way to do this is you first bend the arm at 90 degrees, 
at the elbow and you measure the distance between the acromion process and the olecranon process and you mark the midpoint. Then you um, have them to hang their arm loose and you measure at a midpoint, making sure the type is snug but not tight, and that's how it is done. Given the variability and limitations in some of the previously mentioned definitions, an evidence-informed process was undertaken, and this led to recommendations for a different set of indicators to diagnose and document pediatric malnutrition, which are highlighted here. So you can see in the single data points section, it is recommended to use Z-scores, where a low weight for length or BMI, depending on the age, a mid-upper arm circumference, or length for height, only in the case of severe stunting, would be indicative of malnutrition. When you look now at the bottom for multiple data points, a decline in Z-score or weight for height or weight for length by more than two, or a lower than expected weight gain in an uh, infant under, or young child under the age of two, or significant weight loss in older than two, would all be indicative of mal malnutrition. And you can see here, quite uh, interestingly, in no place is weight for age used, despite that being our classic use for uh, the term failure to thrive. So in summary, the term failure to thrive is not going away, although maybe it should, as the label may be pejorative and may not capture exactly what we are meaning to identify, which are patients who are at risk for uh, or have malnutrition. So the traditional definitions are usually based on a weight less than the third percentile, and on the WHO curve, that would be classified now as underweight. The other traditional definition includes the downward crossing of weight percentiles, often by more than two major percentile lines. And while both of these are easily identified on a growth curve, they require further context and may or may not indicate malnutrition, but can it, at the very minimum can be considered a potential red flag that you need to review. My recommendations would be to use a Z-score for individual anthropometrics by comparison to the WHO references and standards, and then classify uh, as, as they have recommended. Use dynamic changes in weight and length or height over time, because that's preferable over using single measurements. And we should probably be moving towards the definitions of malnutrition, especially so that if you are using the term failure to thrive, you should qualify whether the definition for malnutrition is also met, because that will be helpful clinically in determining what to do next. So before we shift gears for a moment, I'm going to use this question to summarize your recollection of definitions of malnutrition. Pause the recording if you'd like, but the answer here is not a trick. It is a reminder that BMI or weight for length more than two standard deviations below the mean is considered moderate malnutrition as a single data point. It also be, can be used as a reminder that weight for age is not incorporated into the definition, which will eliminate both options one and three, while height for age may be considered to define severe malnutrition, but only if it's more than three standard deviations below the mean. So before we move on to the sequelae of failure to thrive and malnutrition, I wanted to show you some clinical scenarios where crossing percentile lines for weight or height are actually considered normal variants, once more challenging the traditional definitions of failure to thrive. And in each of these scenarios, no need for extensive investigation or concern should be warranted. So we're going to go back to this case one more time, and this is actually my daughter's growth curve. And you will have to take my word for it that I am short, and so is my wife, and so our daughter understandably experienced what some refer to as catch-down growth. Her size at birth depended on maternal nutrition, intrauterine and placental factors like all babies, uh, and then she grew towards her genetic potential, which generally happens over the first two to three years. So there's an initial fall in percentiles, and then you can see her following her percentiles more in line with her intrinsic growth potential. So this likely explains why such a high percentage of infants which high, with um, higher percentile weights at birth may cross down two percentile lines. A similar short genetic potential can follow a patient onwards and lead to the point where the height and or the weight drop below the third percentile. And this is called familial short stature, which you might learn more about in a separate talk. During this time, most will have lag down growth beginning at three to six months that is more severe and prolonged compared to those with catch down growth, leading to downward crossing percentiles in the first two years for both stature and weight. And the key thing though is by age three to four, they grow below 
and parallel to the third percentile line or by z scores they, they sort of maintain their um, relationship to the mean but the key here is the family history so looking at this curve alone may be concerning but if the family history is such that you have a short mid parental height that would support this diagnosis if you did a bone age on these patients they would have a normal bone age and would generally have a normal onset of puberty unfortunately their adult height is likely going to be short consistent with the mid parental height and the way that you calculate the mid parental height is if it's a girl you subtract 13 centimeters from the dad's height and average it with the mom's height if it's a boy you add 13 centimeters to the mom's height and average it with the dad's height and give or take eight and a half centimeters will give you a 95 percent confidence interval for what the target adult height will be quick note here that if the baby is born premature you need to correct for up to two years of age um, when you're measuring weight and height so that is important because if you don't do that they will look like they are falling behind or have fallen behind and then lastly is the scenario called constitutional delay of growth in adolescence otherwise known as late bloomers this is idiopathic there likely is a genetic component to it because there's often a family history of a late pubertal growth spurt and similar to what you would see with familial short stature there's slowing of linear growth in the first three to four years of life with both the stature and weight crossing down percentile lines this may begin at a similar age as failure to as far as familial short stature as early as three to six months and it's hard to distinguish simply by looking at the curve this is where you have to get the history so final adult height is variable and depends on the mid parental height but what you will get is the family history of late pubertal growth spurt and if you aren't sure you can also do a bone age and it will often be delayed relative to the chronological age um, what you then see uh, after the downward crossing is there's generally normal or near normal growth velocity paralleling the third to fifth percentile during pre-pubertal years and then there's late onset puberty and sexual maturation so the height and weight may fall further behind during uh, the average age of puberty 